Terraria is a fun little game that might remind you of Minecraft, but a lot less freedom. I mean, you literally lack a Z-axis to play with, so why wouldn't you play Minecraft? Well, Minecraft has a lot more freedom, sure, but Terraria absolutely destroys it in content. There are three bosses in Minecraft, with subpar rewards for beating them, and all need top-line armor and weapons to reasonably take on. Terraria has 17 bosses, accessory slots, potions that are easily accessible within 15 minutes of casual gameplay, magic, biomes that extend their influence into the cave systems under it, NPCs that live in your base of choice, and plenty more. Similar to Minecraft though, starting the game can be kinda slow, so I'm going to be playing through the whole dumb game just to help anyone who wants to try this game out. I'll be explaining the progression to get through pre-hard mode, the first third of the game, beat for beat. We start with creating a character. Do what you want here, but you won't be looking at this character for very long once he's wearing some decent armor. You'll need to pick what difficulty your character exists in, medium, hard, expert, or journeyman. Finalizing my character, I named him after the worst character in all of gaming. Chip Zanuff. If you don't get it, you're officially lame, and probably not a nerd. We've made the character, but now he needs a world, and these little choices matter a little. We can choose to make the world small, medium, or large, as well as picking our poison biome, corruption or crimson. For simplicity's sake, I chose a medium corruption world, and lo and behold, Chip Zanuff is now stuck in his own little world, wake up super. You spawn in a forest biome, and all you see is grass, trees, this little dude over there, and you, equipped with a copper set of short sword, pickaxe, and axe. Feel free to grab a bit of wood and talk to this guy. He'll give you general bits of tips for the stage of the game you're in. He also tells you everything you can craft using a given item. This is everything I could craft by using the wood I just grabbed. Since I don't have the materials to craft any of these for now, this is the best we've got. So the first thing I want to do is travel the whole length of the map looking for chests and pots to get us started. Bonus points if you find a serviceable cave entrance like this, pre-installed with some pots to break. Any pots you break will typically drop coins, arrows, torches, glow sticks, bombs, and health potions, kind of like a Zelda game. Each chest you find will usually have one major item, some minor items, and some coin. I found some recall potions, shuriken, how fitting, some rope, and this accessory radar. Just after I began, I started purging the local slime population when this little guy gave me a bunch of bombs. You'll want to carry bombs around whenever you can. Their usefulness is always on full display. Here I use them to speed through the process of gathering wood, but there's a problem now. My health is low from the slimes, and the sun is setting. In games like these, you'll already know that nighttime is a bad time to be outside early game. I gave myself a little break with this hut, made a crafting table to upgrade my stuff, and a campfire. This campfire gives you a passive health regeneration when you're close to it. I was also sure to craft a bow and plenty of arrows so I can avoid stabbing these slimes with this prison shank. Nighttime hits while I'm exploring these little holes, because you never know what you could find down there. But I'm able to avoid the mobs for now, so I press on. I found this bundle of loot holding some coin, some torches, tons of rope, as well as some glow sticks and metal bars. Good for early game. The more you adventure around, the more valuables you'll come across. Here I felt I was biting off more than I can chew near the jungle, so I peace out, having to deal with these peeping toms, and retreat back to safety in my hut, not before grabbing these fallen stars. They're valuable to collect, but only appear at nighttime. Risk and reward, I guess. The crafting table can only work with high school crafts projects, so to work with any metal, we'll need an anvil. We can make some right now with the metal we collected in the chest, but I can't make anything after that. This game is all about using to use more, so to speak. We'll just need more. If you want a more cozy feel to your hut, add some walls. If you're dumb like me and misplace a wall, you can only tear it down by making a hammer. If you don't have OCD, you could just ignore it but not me. Almost right away when I left the hut, I found myself, again, with my back against the wall and outgunned. Now seems like a good time to recall potion the hell out of there. 
I'm sure I don't need to elaborate why you should not go into piranha-infested water. Luckily, you can just snipe them out. This chest had a boomerang. This thing has 9 melee damage on it, a huge upgrade from this sharpened candy cane I found when I spawned. A little bit farther is the ocean biome, and you'd think it's over, but there are up to three possible water chests down there. Of course, this early in the game, if you don't have a recall potion or a magic mirror, it's a one-way ticket. Hope you didn't have too much coin. Now seems like a good time to craft again. Yeah, I know, but bear with me. Now I can make a furnace to smelt my ores, and also make this mana star from five of the fallen stars. Using one will increase your maximum magic, and magic tends to be good in this game, as you'll see later. I also use my fallen stars to enchant my boomerang for some added power and a fancy lighting effect. I forgot my anvil at the hut, so after grabbing it really quick, I made a silver pickaxe, this workbench I never used even today, and a lead broadsword. Be sure the whole time you're keeping an eye out for these regional flowers like dayblooms, shiverthorns, and death blossoms. They can be used to create really helpful potions that you'll totally use and not stock up on like Wonderwaff ammo. Oh yeah, the rest of the map. Only one side of the surface was explored, so I wanted to fix that and immediately found the corruption biome, the poison of this world. You'll be well acquainted with these enemies, the Eater of Souls. The damage they deal, the punishment they take, and the environment they inhabit make this a difficult section to get through. It took me a try just to pass through, but I was rewarded with a lucky drop to replace the lead broadsword I just made. It took me another attempt after I passed this living tree, because nobody expects the Spanish Inquisition uh, a second corruption biome, which sent me screaming and kicking right back to spawn. I learned that in this biome, you can't stay in one spot for long before the critters swarm you like flies. Really powerful death flies. Hmm. The third attempt is when I finally broke through. When you get near the end of one of the ends of the map, you'll find the dungeon inhabited by this weird old squatter. He tells me I need a warrant to search his house, and if you ignore him, he calls the cops. And this cop takes absolutely no prisoners. Feel free to break his expensive pottery collection though. You might want to rummage through his short story novel collection, because there's a small chance you could find a spellbook here to give you a nice early start with magic damage. I didn't find it, but it's okay. I only cried for 20 minutes. After I went on my little side scroller, I started to go mining anywhere I could find. Always carry some rope in the caves when you begin a new character. You can use rope really well early game as a means of accessing most areas out of reach. You can place rope and keep feeding more line by holding the mouse down, or you can make 10 rope into a rope line and toss it where you want. Good for getting up through a hole in the ceiling. I ended up finding tons of materials like useful potions, a magic mirror twin, plenty of silver, a radar, and tons of gems like emerald and sapphire, along with almost 20 gold coins by the time I left the caves. One of the reasons I gathered so many gems was to make a hook later on. These hooks are important, and Terraria is made so much easier to play when you have one. The worse gems you use, the slightly shorter hook line you'll get. The other main reason for the gems was for this magic sapphire staff made with some silver. This lets me do two things. Upgrade my ranged ability to include magic, and to find floating islands for more unique loot. You'll see me shooting magic into the air until I hear my staff blast hit a surface. Then I find out exactly where it is, and just defy gravity with rope. This first island was a bust. It was just a sky lake, but it's still cool. A real fisherman's dream come true. I stumbled across a desert pyramid under the sand where I found this gem of an item, the magic carpet. This makes moving around the overworld and caves a breeze, granting me the ability to float for a couple seconds after I jump. This is a little of an unfair advantage over any viewers who don't find the pyramid, but I'm sure you'll find something just as cool, if not cooler, in your world. You'll want to hang on to as many of these lesser health potions as you find. We can upgrade those later. Start mining anything that looks like it's metal. Anything but copper might as well be useless to you if you want to upgrade your tools. They're already copper. Gold, platinum, iron, silver, and lead. Be sure to grab a lot. It takes 2-3 to three ore to make bars, and it takes 10-25 to 25 bars to make most things you'll want. 
keep on the lookout for these little heart crystals because each one gives you another heart container, all the way up to a maximum of 200 HP. Also, if you come across one of these underground cabins, loot its chest immediately. I like to call these treasure rooms. It's like a regular chest, but better items overall. Some useful items you'll want to look for are the Hermes boots, the magic mirror, explosives and arrows, and the almighty double jump, cloud in a bottle. There's tons of these treasure chests around your world, so you'll be finding some of the same items, some of them less than overwhelming. Anyway, it's time to keep the guide safe at night. You can actually get him to move into a home and fulfill your landlord fantasies, except this loser doesn't pay rent. Uh, anyway, to get him to move into a house you made for him, it will need an exterior frame that's around 10 by 5, backdrop walls, a chair, a table, and a light source. You can add doors or platforms as you see fit. Now that he's all cozy in there, surprise, you need to do it again. Uh, a couple of times, actually. Making more of these houses will cause more useful NPCs to spawn and move right in. Some NPCs actually need a condition to be met before they can spawn in. The merchant requires the player to have at least 50 silver. The nurse needs you to have more than 100 max HP. The demolitionist needs you to have an explosive on hand. The dryad needs you to have beaten a boss that's not the queen bee. The arms dealer needs the player to have a gun or bullets on hand. A goblin tinkerer must be found in a cavern after a goblin invasion. And many others that you'll start attracting along the way. Just keep making those houses, you'll fill them over time. If you're trying to make a room work, click on the house icon on the right, grab the question mark symbol, and click on the room that you want. It will tell you if your room is suitable for an NPC, or what it's missing if it isn't. This menu is also where you can see what NPC lives where. Now that you've gotten through the fresh meat section of the game, you'll be going into the caves regularly now to start finding and mining more materials. You'll need them to sort of power creep your way into relevance. The jungle caves is the area of highest risk and reward, so I decided to start there to little success. After that piss poor attempt at spelunking, I figured the caves in the corruption seemed like an okay place to start. There's no chest down here, but there are these glowing crystal orbs. Take caution with these orbs because they spawn a mid-level boss. Once you've made enough progress with your gear, you'll have to fight something big. If the Eye of Cthulhu is a pushover for you, it's time to head to the Corruption, or Crimson if you fly that way, and fight the area's boss. Head into the caves of the area and search for some glowing ball crystals and smash them with your hammer. Sometimes they're hard to get to if your pickaxe can't dig to them, so use bombs to blow away the stone. Breaking each one gives you a cool item, mostly weapons, which you'll likely end up using in about half a minute. Breaking three of these orbs will spawn either the Eater of Worlds or the Brain of Cthulhu. You better have a decent weapon for these fights. During the worm fight, it's much easier to fight him on the surface if you have a fast way up. Either way, a firm grip on your sword is the only thing stopping you from an unwilling one-way trip back to spawn. On the bright side, at least you can break three more orbs. This time, I use the Vile Thorn spell. This drops from the orbs in the corruption, and it's immediately great against the worm. These early bosses, when beaten, will usually drop Demonite, which can be used for weapons, tools, and armor. You can keep farming this boss for Demonite and Shadow Scales. Something important to be sure to make is a Demonite pickaxe due to the ability to mine Hailstone, not to mention Meteorite. When you break these orbs, you increase the chance of a Meteorite falling somewhere on the surface of your world. <sighs> Mine fell in this hole. Lucky me. Look at you, all armored and geared up. Like a little Saiyan getting stronger every time it's about to die. For your next power up, it's time to fight the Keeper of the Dungeon. Talk to the squatter when nighttime hits, but be sure not to stand too close. Skeletron has three hurt boxes, one for his head and one on each hand. His hands can be destroyed, but it doesn't damage Skeletron at all. It simply stops him from mindlessly slapping you into hell, Jesus! You'll need to take out his head. If you're not successful, you'll need to try again another night, but it takes a little while before the squatter comes back to piss on the walls. If you beat Skeletor into the ground, congrats! You can now enter the dungeon underneath without the risk of catching a trespassing charge. Good thing he dropped his deed to the property when he died. The dungeon is full of what you'd assume a dungeon is full of. Loot, skeleton enemies, traps, 
eerie decorations, dungeon slimes, traps, crumbling foundations, spike surfaces, traps. Yeah, you'll be dying often in here, even if you're careful. There's only one unlocked brown chest in here, and it always contains a golden key. This unlocks one locked gold chest, but you can always get more keys from pots, sometimes enemies, and always from dungeon slimes. Look at it. You can see it floating around in all that mush. Just take it from him. Uh, her. It? Off topic. There are tons of these chests lying around with a few different major items locked away. Collect them all like Pokemon and you'll be set for a good chunk of time. Be on the lookout for the water bolt if you didn't find it earlier near the surface for another magic weapon. After looting chests and ignoring this captive valley girl, I was sent back to spawn, and I learned I could make this cool crow hood using bones and silk from the cobwebs I collected. Why wouldn't I get it? It's me. Most of my time after this was spent either in the dungeon finding more loot, mining, or searching these floating islands. There's tons of unique loot up here that could help me. I found some wings earlier to help me kill the skeleton in my closet, but there's more up here. Like this sword that makes stars fall wherever I swing, or this balloon which makes me jump higher. By the way, here's that meteorite that landed a while ago. It ended up in this hole, which complicates things. It's still hot to the touch, so you'll take damage standing on or next to it. Not holding it though, uh, for some reason. You can make some cool armor with a set bonus that makes the laser gun cost zero magic, but I didn't care much for it since I don't want to play that way for the umpteenth time, but it's a valid way to play. After making more rooms, I got the demolitionist to move in and sell me more bombs in exchange for not asking questions. Then the dungeon hobo showed up. And hey, he looks a lot different. It looks like he took a shower and got a job, and he wants to move in. I guess he heard rent was free. This whole time, I've been collecting valuable potions and also the flowers to make them. Just a little effort over time can set you up with the perfect potions for a plan you have. Here you can see the start of my collection, but this chest fills up fast. It took me this long to realize I fought the second easiest boss before I fought the first. Sometimes he'll spawn on his own, following some foreboding purple text about watching you. It was a cakewalk with my current items. The dungeon supplied me with a mythical sword, Muramasa, a shadow key, this gun I found, a blue flail, and more eyes, obviously up to no good. The rest of this game until you beat the first phase will just be spent doing any little thing to get more power. Here I'm fishing. Riveting gameplay, I'm sure. I didn't even find that much, just a fish that could make a potion that would help me fish more. On the bright side, all this bass I found can be cooked and eaten, giving me minor stat boosts on all stats. It's nice to have around. Need a cooking pot though, but I'm sure you'll manage. Something important to note is that there's a trap or wiring system in place that naturally generates in caves. That's why you get shot from seemingly nowhere. Holding a component that needs wiring allows you to see the wires and what they're connected to. Here I found a trap chest. <laughs> Jesus. What were they hoping to kill with all this? God? If I didn't hold the dart trap, I would have been sent back to spawn, no questions asked. Immediately after, I found a mushroom biome. This is an underground biome where glowing blue mushrooms grow everywhere, alongside a little loot. You know those lesser healing potions you've been piling up? Hopefully you haven't sold them, because you can use the mushrooms found in this biome to upgrade them to standard healing potions. They could sell for more, or, you know, heal you more than a scratch at a moment's notice. I grabbed somewhere around 300 mushrooms because they're that nice to have around. My mining trip was cut short by the sounds of a goblin army advancing on my town. I didn't think I rated that much of a threat. I guess they really want revenge for all those scouts I killed. I would have been in trouble here if I wasn't so far into the game. The armor I have let me tank a lot more hits and the weapons cut them down like paper. They should have sent more troops. I could have used more cash. I was looking at my crafting potential right after, and I saw I could make this robe with poor defense in exchange for more magic using capabilities. I've been known for my bad decisions in the effort of looking cooler and more niche advantages, but I believe in myself, and my drip. I found another floating island with another set of wings in them. That'll come in handy later. There's actually another boss in this game that you can take on before the final boss of the section. The queen bee is a boss that you can spawn by finding her beehive somewhere deep in the jungle. You spawn her by killing her larva. 
I got humbled by the queen, despite Skeletron being a harder boss. I should not have dumped defense. Blood Moon! Uh, great. This is a special event where during the whole night, enemies are harder, spawn more, and zombies can open doors. It's okay if you're not home. Your NPCs don't have any mobs spawning near them, but if you are home, you should probably block the doors. I got lucky while fishing and got a vampire frog staff from this menacing eyeball. Staffs like these allow you to summon a homie to fight for you. As we are now, I can't spawn more than one, but there is an entire class built around making your summons as powerful and plentiful as possible, the summoner class. Right now I'm favoring magic, but a little helper is kinda nice. Ah, the goblin tinkerer. He's among the more useful NPCs, but I don't have the housing to fit him right now. Be sure to grab some obsidian, you can turn it into an obsidian skull, which lets you step on hot surfaces like meteorite or hellstone. We're gonna need that where we're going. You can also use the Goblin Tinkerer's workshop to combine your obsidian skull with your cobalt shield. There's tons of little combo items you can combine with this table. First we have to make a spot for him though. I gave him this little spot in the corner for uniqueness factor. Kinda like the high school nerd from 1980, you never really see him outside of the safety of the track and field bleachers. He helped me make specter boots, a cloud in a balloon, and this mana regeneration band. I remembered about my spare set of wings that I found and I figured that it was a great excuse to invite my friend to the playthrough. After all, multiplayer makes this game a good bit cooler. Your friend can spawn in with any character he's created thus far for any of his worlds. He could just come in here with endgame weapons and equipment, but neither of us wanted any unfair advantages. I don't want to teach the game by saying, invite your friend with his character who already beat the game. It would be pointless to try playing if they do everything. Shout out to the homie Dio. Oh shit, he followed us! <laughs> Me and Dio spent a majority of our time on the world just passing time, either mining, exploring, or fighting. At this point in the game, we're almost strong enough to venture off into hell, the biggest challenge of pre-hard mode thus far. The goal is to mine Hellstone, which is hot like meteorite and even spawns lava when it breaks, as well as open shadow chests using the shadow key I found in the dungeon. This key has infinite uses, so you only ever need one. The Hellstone arrows are always nice to have around too. The Hellstone items are some of the best you can get your hands on in this phase of the game, so it's important to gather as much as you can. You need to be careful of the lava when you do, or again, one way trip back to spawn, baby. Hell has a couple of unforgiving enemies to face. This huge bone worm can take a lot of hits and explodes in and out of walls to hurt you. These fire imps are similar to those skeleton sorcerers from the dungeon, except this time it's uh, fire. Finally, there are these little demons flying around. Sometimes they carry a little voodoo doll of the loser we met at the beginning of the game. I don't know what they have against him, but one thing is certain. You cannot let this doll fall into the lava. If it does, you'll be flung headfirst into the final fight of pre-hard mode, the wall of flesh. This wall hits like a truck, and it never stops moving until it hits the end of the world if you don't die first. Trying to portal home is an instant kill no matter what. So if you sign up for this fight, you'll need an arena. Unfortunately for Dio and I, the wall spawned when neither of us were prepared. When we tried to leave, you know what happened to us, and we realized we need a little better equipment. Since this wall moves non-stop towards the furthest edge of the map, your arena will look a lot like a long platform runway. You'll need to set this up before the fight's even considered, unless you're certified godlike. You have to carve a path through any underworld bases that you cross, because the last thing you want for this fight is to get stuck on a small opening. If you want even more assistance, you can place campfires along the walkway that give constant active regeneration. But for now, we should log off. While I was in the underworld, however, I did find this flame lash. It's a magic weapon that spawns a ball of fire and moves with my cursor until I let go of the mouse. If there's an enemy nearby, it'll auto-aim to them and deal a decent chunk of damage. Now my magic character is showing his colors. There's a better version of this weapon, the magic missile, somewhere in the dungeon chest. I guess I didn't farm enough, so I went back in for that juicy loot, and when I got it, I stayed in there to get better with it until it was time to fight the wall with Dio. I also farmed for a few more heart crystals since he was a little short. With the walkway made and the campfires placed, 
our armed to the teeth characters were much more than ready to fight the wall of flesh. Alright, here we go. When he spawns, he will be moving towards whatever ocean biome is farther away, and you can use this to your advantage. Early in the fight, I made certain to take out as many of these little chompers as I can before they could become a problem. This makes the fight leagues easier. I could talk about the fight like it was some kind of cinematic masterpiece, but in reality, you and I just threw everything we had at a decent range, and it just sort of worked. With the Wall of Flesh defeated and the Pwn Hammer obtained, the spirits of good and evil were unleashed upon this world and we were going to need some better shit than what we had. That being said, we started farming the Wall of Flesh for some decent weapons, like the Clockwork Assault Rifle and the Buster Sud... Uh, Breaker Blade. Right. Regardless, we did it. We beat the wall, we got some loot, and got through the first third of the game. And that's as far as this video goes. If you followed along and got this far with me, you're all set up to start this game on your own and get better without my help. This game gets significantly harder after you defeat the wall, but don't get disencouraged. After all, you made it this far, didn't you? If you'd like to see me talk about the next third of this game, then you'll have to give this video some good reception. Even if you don't want to, leaving likes and comments tells me you want to see more. If you'd like to see me play the game in real time while I record, head over to my Twitch channel, twitch.tv forward slash crowhv. I love interacting with chat, so say hi while you're here. On that note, I just spotted some shiny things from my collection, so I gotta fly. Peace, fellas. Lucky for us, we got one. So I right. guess you just um, bam. hold it and then hold. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, I have to enable that too. Yeah. Ready? Ready? Oh, I already started going after you said that. Oh, ready. shit! <laughs> ah! Oh, you have to be separate. <laughs> shit! <laughs> okay. Uh, uh...